Hello everyone, welcome to PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your last part of the test number 4 where we would be discussing the last 20 questions from 81 to 100. So let us get started and see how you are supposed to approach these kind of questions for your upcoming prelims. So question number 81 which was asked was with respect to a report and the question was the state of the global water resources report is prepared by which of the following I think I told you n number of times so whenever you read any any update or any news with respect to report or any index the very first thing you are supposed to prepare or you have to take care is which particular organization is the one who is going to release it prepare it and uh, you know publish it now the question is very straightforward and the question is the global water resources so when you when you think of the water resources clearly world economic forum is not going to be the right uh, choice probably you have some doubt maybe uh, like you know with respect to environment program or IPCC but out of the three the most appropriate choice choice is the one that we have with option number B because I'm talking about the global water resources so my best choice here, even if I have to do a guesswork is the World Meteorological Organization. Meteorological Organization is the one that take care of the climate as well as the oceans. So probably this is the right choice. And here also the question is medium, but I think could be attempted easily because clearly United Nations Environment Program is more about the environment conservation, something like that. So cannot be the right choice, right? Maybe you have this option on uh, the climate change kind of thing. But again, clearly climate change uh, has altogether a very different domain. So very easy to guess this kind of question because the options are quite obvious here, right? So the option uh, B was the right one. So this uh, state of global uh, world, global water resources report is published by World Meteorological Organization. And uh, the last report that it, it published was way back in 2022. And uh, there were many, many important findings which were there uh, by the World Meteorological Organization in this report where this report specifically says nearly 4 billion people, understand 400 crore people. So for nearly 4 billion people are experiencing severe water scarcity at least one month every year. Look at the, look at the kind of water crisis the world is facing today. You know, that is very a specific thing that the state of global water resources highlighted uh, in their report. And it this report also told many other things like, for example, today the, the atmosphere is getting warmer and warmer. And because of the intensification of the atmosphere, the world today is facing heavy precipitation episodes that is leading to flooding and very extreme at some areas the world is having intense droughts and both these events of flooding and droughts has actually increased due to the climate change you know and this report also told because of the rise in the global temperatures the glacial lakes have also increased that is that ultimately becomes a disaster when the glacial lakes become glacial lake outburst flow which is called GLOF that becomes a disaster for all of us right this is important uh, report guys do take care of now, please, uh, just to give you one extra information, since we are talking about the WMO, so just to give you a brief information about that, you never know, you may have a separate MCQ coming on the WMO also. This is an intergovernmental organization which was uh, set up way back uh, in 1950. Before WMO came into the play, it, its predecessor was International Meteorological Organization, IMO, that was actually set up way back in 1873. Uh, after the Vienna International Meteorological Conference. But later on, this uh, IMO was replaced uh, by the WMO way back in 1950. There are 192 members. India is also a member. WMO has become a specialized agency of United Nations for meteorology. And that, and again, not just meteorology, it also take care of the operational hydrology. And that why that is why it was the most appropriate choice uh, with respect to the water resources and that's why we took this particular thing into guesswork 
that okay this is the most appropriate one with headquarters in geneva switzerland i think question number 1 very obvious for everyone question number 82 uh, now this question is actually talking about the glacier lakes talking about the cloud burst and the glof so these all two three things are very uh, interrelated kind of topics so we know a lot about the glacier lakes and i think uh, this particular question is something that you guys could have attempted very easily there is no absolutely no problem look at the statements without even having more information you can still understand understand the questions and the demand of the question very well the first statement says the glacier lake form when glacial erodes the land and that is filled by the glacial melt water very obvious that is the that is the most logical explanation what glacial lake could be right this uh, first statement is correct and when glacial lake outburst flood or outburst flow that glof occur whenever the boundary around the glacial lake breaks and all the water of the glacial lakes flows in uncontrolled way that causes catastrophic floods that is called the glof so these two statements are absolutely of no problem now the only problem i have is with the statement number 3 now read it very carefully unlike the other natural hazards glof can only be triggered by earthquake or an ice avalanche 90% times the, the the statements having all only these kind of things make the statement very extreme you know there are there can be more than two factors there are there can be n number of factors that can actually trigger a glof not just the two earthquake and uh, uh, ice avalanche it could be many factors even if you can imagine that that you can think of two three more factors right so that only thing is a problem so clearly this is not the uh, right option that we have now maybe maybe you have a problem with respect to statement number 4 it talks about the cloud burst so first we'll learn about the cloud burst and then i'll get you to this statement once again we all have heard this word cloud burst in fact upsc i think uh, two or three years back there was a question in the mains where the cloud cloud burst was asked by the upsc what is what exactly is the meaning of cloud burst we know that cloud burst means there is going to be intense rainfall activity like but but every heavy rainfall is not supposed to be a cloud burst there are certain criteria that when this kind of a rainfall we are going to classify or associate with the cloud burst there is a specific parameter you know if you are receiving 10 cm or more rainfall in one particular area uh, in one particular hour and that to over a very small area and that small area should not exceed more than uh, 10 uh, uh, square kilometer right so that is the kind of area that you are supposed to be a part of that so cloud burst means in in a very uh, specified small area i am going to have heavy rainfall in in almost one hour and you can also put it in another words like during the cloud cloud burst event any place receives 10% of the annual rainfall within that one hour so in a nutshell cloud burst is having more than normal rainfall in very short span in a very localized area that actually makes the situation worst though the cloud burst can happen in plains but mostly most commonly we see the cloud burst activities associated with the hilly regions because there they have more favorable topography and in hilly regions situation become even difficult because cloud burst often triggers landslides flash floods and other kind of associated problems so now you know the answer the first second and fourth statements are absolutely correct and the third one not correct so my answer here is only 3 this question was a medium one but at least at least few statements are very easy and something some risk you could guys could have taken considering and eliminating 3 and uh, taking a risk on statement number 4 i mean it's a it was a it was a challenging question because uh, the numbers are involved but you can easily handle these kind of questions question number 83 is going to take you back to the history the question 83 is talking about you have to identify the battle uh where that the travancore forces 
led by the king Martin Verma, defeated the Dutch East India Company forces. Now you have very, all the four battles are very historic. Let me tell you all the battles. But the right answer, what is the right answer that you need to understand here? The answer is A. It is Battle of Collateral. Now please, this I always feel these kind of questions are a bit tough and something you can't really take risk about because there is absolutely no clue involved because it's a history and history is a fact it's purely fact based option you can't do anything about it so if you have no clue please skip this question because it it demands a very deep knowledge of history talking about the four battles the right one is the battle of collateral that is very historical battle guys way back in 1741 the Travancore Kingdom, uh, right now we have in Kerala, that Travancore area. So Travancore Kingdom and the Dutch East India Company fought this particular battle where the uh, Travancore forces were led by the King Martin Verma. And this is a very historical battle because this in this battle, the King uh, Martin Verma actually defeated the Dutch East India Company. And this battle is celebrated in history of India as first victory of Asians over the Europeans because we defeated Europeans way back in 1741. Now talking about the second uh, option that was the battle of the uh, Kandalur Salai. Now this is actually a naval battle which was fought between the Cholas and the Cheras where the Cholas uh, were uh, led by Raja, uh, Raja, Ravi, uh, Raja Raj Chola won. And he won over the Cheras. So this was a naval battle. Again, very historic. Uh, another battle which was there in the option was battle of the Ned, uh, Nedam Kota. And this battle goes way back in 1789. Now this has its relation with the third anglo mysore war where Tipu Sultan was involved, not the King Martan Verma. Okay. Now battle of Tali Kota is again very, very historic battle guys. Battle of Talikota <coughs> is a battle that took place in our Deccan region where the forces of Hindu Raja of Vijayanagara fought against the four allied Muslim Sultans and those four uh, confidentiaries were Bijapur, Bidar, Ahmednagar and Golconda and this was a battle between 1 is to 4 and this is a very historic battle by the way that was fought in in present day North Karnataka state. So Tali Kota belongs to Northern Karnataka today. So uh, now you know the right answer is the A, right? That takes us to the question number 84. Now this question 84 is specifically talking about uh, this, uh, what, what do you call as this question 84 is specifically about the spatial objects where the question is talking the, about the comets and the meteor showers. Now again, this is a very interesting question. First statement is very simple, very easy that you can easily uh, attempt guys. It, it says the comets, we know the comets, right? They are the icy frozen gases that holds together small pieces of the rocky metallic minerals. Very simple statement. We know what the, what the comets are. Now many, many times we have this confusion. What exactly is a comet? Now look, look at the, the diagram first. If you look at the diagram here, this is how the comet look like. Comet is nothing. It is it is made up of ice. It is uh, this uh, includes the mass of ice. It has some rock particles. It has some dust. These are the three main constituents by which the comet is made up of. And comet is always associated with the tail. Why? First of all, comets uh, have a very long uh, orbit around the sun, unlike the normal planets, which are comparatively closer. So since um, uh, the, the, the comets, they try, they goes way far away from the sun and then they come occasionally after a certain time. Since they travel very far away, that's why uh, they are frozen always. They always contain some ice particles because going that far, the sunlight does not reach them, right? Now, interestingly, when they are coming, when they come near or they are coming towards the sun, or closer to the sun because of the sun, sun's heat that particular ice start melting and as a result as a result now if the comet is coming in this direction so obviously the melting ice would go in the opposite direction and that gives a look as if the the 
comet has a tail that is the reason of having it a tail right this is important there are other uh, such bodies that we have in our space of course you are aware about the asteroids you are aware about the meteoroids both of them are rocky masses the only difference is uh, the, uh, comparatively the asteroids are way larger they are bigger uh, than the meteoroid asteroids are mainly present between uh, the mars and the jupiter we have an asteroid belt so like 90% maximum asteroids uh, they also orbit the sun whereas meteoroids they have no such defined path they don't orbit the sun the meteoroids and they travel very haphazardly here and there in the space now if the meteoroid if that rocky mass called meteoroid is away and outside the earth atmosphere it is meteoroid but by chance it start traveling towards the earth and by chance it enters the earth atmosphere the friction of the gases will start burning it and then this meteorite becomes the shooting star the burning star called the meteor and that's if you have if you have n number of meteors burning in the atmosphere at once that's what you call as meteor shower that's what we call as a meteor shower right that is important and uh, like like maximum times the the whole meteor gets burned in the atmosphere does not reach the earth but by chance sometimes the meteors are very very big and after partial burning they somehow reach the planet earth and then we call them as meteorite they become a meteorite and wherever they struck the earth uh, of course there they create a lot of crater or we call them as impact craters so impact craters are generally caused by the meteorite uh, thing right and one very good example that we have is the lonar lake of india so in maharashtra the lonar lake that we have was actually created by this meteorite impact if you look at the question guys so here the first statement looks absolutely correct and uh, even the second statement is correct which says the orinoid meteor shower now this this again the second statement is very tricky and difficult because it is asking about one very specific meteor shower there are many many meteor showers but in this case the orinoid meteor shower brightens the night sky every october because you have to be careful about the month here and it is formed when the earth travels through the remnants left by halley's comet it is also one of the very famous comets that appears after every 76 years it has a very specific periodicity so yeah the uh, due to the remnants of the headley we got this uh, orinoid meteor shower so yeah both statements are correct answer is c but again this question i would say it was a tough one because of the statement number 2 so i will not advise you to uh, risk it unnecessary don't risk it you can skip if you are not sure about the number 2 because you you can't uh, do any guesswork because it's pure fact based question upsc generally deliberately ask you such kind of questions which has absolute one statement is very easy one statement is very difficult that that is going to uh, confuse you even more question number 84 85 uh, that was again from the history very important question and i think this is this particular uh, question is something which is very basic uh, uh, thing that you read in our history i mean this is this is one of the most basic concepts that you read not just in history but even certain part is uh, is something that you read in polity as well when you talk about the the union of india how india uh, got united you know we used to have more than 560 princely states and how those princely states uh, you know came together to to make the union of india we are not federation we are union right <laughs> this question is all about that so of course it talks about the instrument of accession by which uh, many of the states uh, they joined indian union and uh, it talks specific things uh, about it now again this question can be solved with little bit of your uh, common sense uh, what common sense let's try to understand so when india got uh, uh, independence before that in before india got independence in 1947 so there were uh, more than 560 570 around princely states and there were peaceful negotiations between them and almost all the princely states they agreed to uh, be a part of indian union however there were four 
problematic states and those princely states were junagadh hyderabad kashmir and manipur and they did not sign the instrument of accession so government of india had to deal with these four hostile states in some way or the other like like in case of junagadh the issue was solved by plebiscite uh in kashmir of course we we got the signing of instrument of accession after kashmir was attacked by some of the pakistan supported uh, militia right similarly in hyderabad hyderabad also was not willing to uh, join india and wanted to be a part of pakistan which is clearly not feasible uh, considering the geography of hyderabad which is uh, purely in india so the government had to uh, deal the situation by using a military operation so government of india literally had to annex the state of hyderabad and the name of the military operation that we used is operation polo this is a very imp important uh, operation that indian army took way back in 1948 and after that we got the merging of hyderabad similarly in case of manipur we got a merger agreement so so the point is and of course the whole the the whole credit goes to sardar vallabhai patel called the iron man of india because the way he had conducted everything right interesting now if you uh, look uh, you know the time india got independent that time the british india was actually divided into three different different uh, units there were british indian provinces which were directly controlled by british india or the, uh, the british government there were princely states controlled by the princes uh, but those princes of course they accepted the british supremacy the paramount the, that that policy used to be called as the paramount mount c uh, means uh, the like we are all are uh, we all are ruling under the umbrella of uh, so called british uh, you know people and uh, then of course so by the time india got independence britishers gave those princely states a choice i mean all british indian provinces they were made part of india but the princely states were given a choice they could join either india they could join either pakistan or if they wish they could remain independent as well but unfortunately that decision of a princely state was not left to the people of that state it was purely the decision of the princely rulers and that is why we got the problem Uh, in the state of hyderabad uh, junagadh kashmir and manipur because because of this choice of remaining independent joining india or pakistan okay now this is important if you go back to the question guys you have absolutely no problem the first statement is purely correct the second is also correct so be careful junagadh we got the plebiscite the problem is with the statement number 3 we know half statement is correct that uh, state of hyderabad was annexed by military 48 but what was the name of the operation operation polo operation blue star is another operation which was done by indian military 1984 that was done by indira gandhi against the bhindra wala who was hiding inside the golden temple that is altogether different thing operation blue star is different operation polo was the one that we a next hyderabad so that makes statement number 3 incorrect fourth is also correct that yes uh, uh, okay now please okay yeah fourth is not correct fourth is also incorrect because if this statement says that britishers gave princely states only cho two choices and it says there was no option of remaining independent of course there was an option so third and fourth are wrong Brit uh, the princely states had the option of remaining independent as well that is the kind of option which was actually uh, you know opted by the kashmir that kashmir wanted neither wanted to be part of india or pakistan so uh, here the answer is only b this particular question was a medium one but very easy to attempt because these are very famous historical facts something that every upsc aspirant should be aware of question number 86 was again it, you are given some statements and it 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 says which statement is not correct now this question is with respect to the civil disobedience movement and it talks specifically about the 1936 faizpur session now b again this is history you have no scope of any uh, manipulation you have to go it straight forward 
So what you are supposed to learn uh, about the civil disobedience movement that started way back in 1930s and that civil disobedient movement was suspended in 1934. The time civil disobedience movement was suspended by the Congress, there was a, there was a conflict between the members of the Congress where some congressmen, they, they wanted that they want to enter the legislature, they want to be a part of the government and by joining the post, joining the government and entering the legislatures, they want to continue the work of the Congress, but that within the government. These kind of congressmen that whose approach was to join the government and function for the interest of Congress, they were known as constitutionalist. At the other end, there were some people, some Congress leaders, they wanted to continue the revolutionary uh, character of the Congress. They, they said, we should not be a part of government with the Britishers. We should continue our revolution from the outside. And those people, uh, they decided to form a party called the Socialist Party, but that was formed within the Congress and the name of the party was Congress Socialist Party. Don't think this was a separate entity. It was, it was like a party within a party that was formed. Just as a, uh, as a, as a second thought that uh, this is how we want Congress to run. Okay, this is important. However, in 1948, this dual party membership kind of thing was prevented and uh, later on and that's why after 1948, Congress said uh, you can't continue two parties within one party and that's why the socialists were, for, uh, were forced to uh, have a separate socialist party and that's how the Socialist Party of India was formed 1948. If you look at another interesting thing, so the question is asking about the Fezerpur session. This is one of the most important sessions of Congress. It was the 50th session of the Indian Congress that was that took place in the Fezpur in Jalgaon district. Why this is so important? Because Fezpur session was the first session that was held in the rural setting. You know, one of the biggest criticism of the Congress is initial Congress was that this is a party of elite members and only the urban people are, you know, taking all that suit, boot, wala, babu log, they are taking part in the uh, Congress, right? Especially during the times of moderates and early uh, other people. But then uh, it was, it was um, you know, realized that without taking the revolution to the rural areas, you can't have a mass movement. And that is where the Fezerpur session comes to the play, first session that was held in the rural settings. And that was influenced by the Kisan Manifesto. And because of this session, the, there was a beginning of the agrarian programs that was uh, the original Kisan Manifesto and that was embraced by Congress at the Fezpur sessions. And from there onwards, Congress included the demands of the people of rural areas, especially with respect to reducing the land taxes, with respect to reducing the rent by 50% uh, margins, you know, and also ensuring the minimum wages and all the concerns of the rural people. So the Fazpur session definitely holds a very important part in the history of our revolution. Now, if you look at the statement, which statement is not correct? So second statement is absolutely correct. It says, yes, Fezpur session under leadership of Nehru, agrarian program was approved. You just have learned that. There is problem with the first statement. What is the problem? Look, it says, civil disobedience movement, some Congress decided to enter the legislatures and work for the cause and form the Congress Socialist Party. You see the problem here. So those who decided, those who wanted to enter the legislatures, they were constitutionalist. And those who do not want to enter the legislature, they formed the Congress Socialist Party. And that is where the problem happens. So here, answer uh, the uh, you are supposed to figure out which answer is not correct. So A, 1 is not correct. Now this question, again, it was a, I, I would say it was a medium one, but uh, something that you should not attempt if you are not confident. You can take a risk, but for that you need to have a knowledge because history questions are always tough uh, because uh, uh, even a small fact here and there can make the whole uh, question uh, get out of your hands. 
question 84 uh, 87 is again with respect to the history but this particular question but this particular uh, question was an easy one why it talks about mahatma gandhi's all india ma satyagraha now many many of you may have may have thought that this statement looks wrong because you know gandhi's uh, initial revolutions were in champaran in kheda and other uh, you know districts in in ahmednagar also but you should remember the question is specifically asking you not any local satyagraha movement it talks it, it is asking you first all india movement and first all india movement was the satyagraha that gandhi ji started 1919 against the rowlatt act and that actually made gandhi a pan indian leader so in a way first statement is absolutely correct understood now please look this question is difficult why it talks about many many acts it talks about the rowlatt act it talks about the pune pact and it also talks about what gandhi ji thought uh, about the uh, zionist state in palestine the, the the jewish state in palestine you need to learn certain things about that we'll come back to the question later so you know that uh, uh, britishers enacted a draconian law as the rollet act which is which was uh, which was called the the black law the kala kanun why under the rollet act it empowered the british government they could suppress the voices against the british government under the rollet act the the police could arrest anybody anybody without any warrant and nobody no indian was allowed to keep any kind of weapon with themselves this was a crashing down movement crashing down act passed by the britisher to crush the revolution in india and that for uh, against that rollet act gandhi gave a call for satyagraha against the rollet act in march 1919 he formed satyagraha sabha to organize that satyagraha against the rollet act and that was the first all india satyagraha to add to certain important thing you know it was this it was this satyagraha inspired by that and it was the it was the opposition of rollet act that unfortunately 13th april 1919 we got the jallia wala bag massacre those people were also peacefully they were opposing they were revolting against the rollet act yes this satyagraha started in march but unfortunately in april we we had one of the deadliest massacres on indian soil now going further with the with the question uh, there is one statement that talks about the pune pact this is a very important pact that was signed between ambedkar and gandhi but why there was a need of such kind of an act because guys in 1932 britishers played a very tricky card you know that in 1909 britishers already uh, gave separate electorate uh, electorate to the muslims what is the meaning of the term separate electorates separate electorate like for example in in case of muslims that was given 1909 separate electorate means that the candidate should be muslim and those who are going to elect that or going to give vote even the voters should be of same religion the muslims so only muslims have a right to choose their muslim leaders is it good for the unity absolutely not and that's what the britishers wanted they wanted to break our hindu muslim unity and for that matter they gave under their so called divide and rule policy 1909 they gave muslims a separate electorate indians objected but britishers did not listen 1919 which which is famously called as the uh, the chamsford reforms in 1919 even further other communities like christians sikhs they were also given the separate electorates but then britishers started something very gruesome 1932 donald uh, uh, was um, uh, the macdonald uh, was the was the was the prime minister and he announced the he announced separate electorates for the minorities means within hindu religion within the hindu religion the, now he was dividing the caste so all the depressed classes all the all the uh, you know scheduled caste all the depressed class 
they were given a separate electorate and for that matter gandhi strongly opposed gandhi said you can't divide hindus as per their caste because that would be a big blow to the unity of indians and gandhi for that matter gandhi said you can't give a separate electorate to the depressed classes however however ambedkar was excited and he he really wanted that uh, the depressed classes because of course at that time the depressed classes were hardly having any representation in the political sphere so ambedkar believed that separate electoral process for dalits it was an essential to give them political representation it will help them empower themselves politically but then then gandhi make ambedkar understand that we we would give you a reservation within our own electorate within our own election process but please don't demand a separate electorate for the dalits and for that matter gandhi uh, went on a hunger strike to save the life of gandhi ambedkar gandhi signed and they agreed under the puna act and instead of separate electorates this puna pact said that the congress is going to reserve seat for the dalits in the provincial central legislative assemblies and somewhere the concept of reservation was was began uh, by this particular act so somewhere the concept the notion of reservation goes back to the puna pact where the reservation was given to the dalits and later on after independence you know how the reservation things had started as far as the the jews are concerned so mahatma gandhi he was deeply sympathetic to the plight of jewish people in europe and gandhi always said that yes the persecution of the jews that was done by uh, by uh, uh, you know hitler you know so of course he he had a great sympathy for the jewish people and he said yes i thoroughly acknowledge the 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 kind of persecution the jewish people had gone through this is totally inhumane but but despite being sympathetic uh, mahatma gandhi opposed the jewish nation state in palestine he did not favor in 1938 uh, in an article the jews in harijan so mahatma gandhi clearly said that i am not in favor of having a separate Uh, state in the name of israel in palestine so if you know these three very important facts now you can say the first and second statements are correct sir but the third is incorrect because it says the gandhi supported the creation of jewish state no gandhi was sympathetic to jews but never wanted a separate state for the jewish people so that makes the statement number 3 incorrect if i eliminate i am going to get my answer as c 1 and 2 are correct tough question tough very you know um fact oriented question you can take a risk it if at least you know or you are in a position to eliminate some of the statements otherwise don't take the risk these are very hard questions history based questions now if you look at the statement uh, question number 88 now this again is a very fact based question now and this is one of the most common type of question that upsc can ask you from history where you are given some name of the authors and their work and you have to figure out which statement is correct when it comes to mahatma gandhi yes mahatma gandhi had written many many books and many many articles and one such was the third class in uh, third class in indian railway this is correct even zakir the dr zakir husain he wrote ala talim this is absolutely correct there is problem with the statement number 2 and 3 ambedkar was the one who wrote the problem of rupee its origin solution and the arctic home in the vedas was actually written by bal gangadhar tilak so the right answer is only two pairs are correct again this question was a tough one don't take unnecessary risk because these are purely purely and purely uh, based on your knowledge but there is one clue i can think here you know uh, you know ambedkar was not very much fan of hinduism you know that right and he clearly never embraced uh, or he later on he converted himself to buddhist also because he had a lot of problems with the hindu religion especially in terms of the caste system that hindus had so think about it why ambedkar will write something on vedas because vedas are the scriptures of hinduism 
and in the vedas there was uh, this so called the caste system was mentioned so if you think about it at least you can figure out that uh, okay ambedkar does not you know seem to be a something writing on the vedas similarly you think of bal gangadhar tilak bal gangadhar tilak was a revolutionary person bal gangadhar tilak was the father of modern uh, uh, revolution uh, revolution in india right i mean he he is not supposed to write something on the problem of rupee some scholar can write these kind of things some somebody has to be a, a scholastic personality so that suits more ambedkar and uh, vedas is something that you know suits more to tilak that kind of that kind of guess work you can figure out and then you can eliminate the two so that way you can take a risk if you if you if these kind of things click in your head at the time of the exam right so talking about some of the important works of gandhi so gandhi edited many newspapers like indian opinion young india nav jivan and harijan and there were many many books written by gandhi of course we we all know about this book called my experiment with truth but gandhi wrote many famous books like for example the hind swaraj the third class in indian railway which was the question song from the prison india of my dreams similarly bal gangadhar tilak wrote very interesting books like for example the orion or the research into the antiquity of vedas in english he also wrote the arctic home in vedas geeta rahasya one of the most famous works of bal gangadhar tilak similarly the books written by bhim rao ambedkar included very very famous books like annihilation of caste who were the shudras waiting for a visa what congress and gandhi had done to the untouchables the problem of the rupee and the revolution and counter revolution in ancient india all these works are very important works and worldwide recognized works of bal uh, of uh, mr bhim rao ambedkar talking about zakir husain yes he wrote uh, he wrote the ama talim this is important book again from zakir husain question 89 was with respect to the state reorganization act this is again very important question a very important topic i would say <clears throat> look uh, you know after independence uh, in india there was a very heavy demand many regions they were demanding that they wanted a separate state based on their language was language can language be a criteria for a reorganization of state i mean can you make a, a language as a base of giving few people a separate state that was a big question and very big question in way back in 1947 1948 so just after independence these kind of demands they came up uh, where the people demanding separate states based on their culture based on their language especially now interestingly in 19 june 1948 for for that purpose to solve out that purpose the very first commission that was set up in india was dhar commission and dhar commission uh, in their report they opposed any reorganization at that particular time because india just got the independence 1948 was a very crucial time for india lot of upside down things were going on and even this dhar commission clearly advised not to create the provinces or the states based on linguistic grounds their dhar commission specially mentioned that only administrative convenience should be taken into account while you are forming provinces don't take don't consider language as a as a base of creating separate state because there was a fear that india should not be further divided we just had witnessed the partition isn't it guys so we already had witnessed the partition based on religion we did not want country to be divided on the lines of language but again the dhar commission report did not satisfy the people demanding such things so to look further into the matter december 1948 another another uh, commission was set up and that was that is famously known as the jvp committee what is jvp committee it stands for jawahar lal sardar vallabhai patel and dr patabi sitaramaiah these three people they also look into the matter deeply but again they were also against following the linguistic principle and they said it is not good for india security unity and economic prosperity we must not separate uh, the state based on the language but again the demands were there and finally um, uh, yeah there was a there was a government of india had to reappoint had to make another commission called as 
the state reorganization commission which is famously known by the term fazal ali commission because he was the chairman of the commission and that was formed 1953 and finally it submitted its report 1955 and on the basis of the report of fazal ali commission finally the state reorganization act was passed 1956 one of the most landmark uh, act passed by indian parliament and finally based on the ali fazal ali commission we had uh, uh, we had uh, got the states some of the states separated based on the language okay and andhra pradesh was the first state to be formed uh, because they wanted to get separated from the from from the uh, tamil speaking areas and the telugu speaking areas were separated from tamil speaking and andhra pradesh was the first state that was formed after the state reorganization act india was divided into 14 states and the six union territories very very important guys <clears throat> now please uh, look at one interesting fact here uh, this statement other than these three this question also talks about the operation vijay and you should be aware what operation vijay is you know india got independence 1947 but there were few few areas which were not controlled by india and one such was goa goa daman diu these were the indian states which were actually under the control these these were portuguese territories so india then requested the portuguese territory portuguese government that please hand over and transfer the power of these territories to india because daman diu goa belong to us when portuguese did not uh, cooperate with india finally indian army had to invade yes we had to invade and annex goa daman diu and then they were made part of indian union in 1961 and that was under operation vijay initially they were made the union territories and finally goa become a state in 1987 when things were settled down do remember goa for one more reason it is the only it it was the only state not is it was the only state where we had the union uh, uniform civil code there was a portuguese uniform civil code which was there from the ages from way long time now recently one indian state is there that has recently implemented and passed the U, uh, union uh, uniform civil code for that do you name the do you know the name of the state if you know which state recently uh, uh, passed the bill on the ucc do let me know in the comment box it's a very burning topic so you must be aware which state has recently passed that if you look at the statements yes here guys all the four statements are absolutely correct my answer is supposed to be d question undoubtedly question is tough but you could have attempted that because everything is very very famous the organization act itself is very very famous that takes us us to the question number 90 question 90 is with respect to the intelligence bureau talks about the raw as well now let us say i have no idea i don't have much knowledge about the question at least try to read even if i mean there would be some questions which you know that you are not very comfortable with but at that at that particular kind of time without getting panicked just try to read the question sometime reading the question with a peaceful mind can solve the purpose for example in this case look at the third statement it says research analysis wing the word wing is already there in raw it says the raw was intentionally established as an agency not a wing in order to bypass the rti come on the name itself says it is a wing it is not an agency like ib is an agency but bureau uh, research and analysis wing is a wing not a agency so clearly my third statement is wrong because the name says everything eliminate the option number 3 without even reading you got your answer number a this question was tough but very easy because smartness is going to help you out you could have simply eliminated the wrong option and this way you you can get a right answer so first statement and second are correct what what we have to learn uh, with respect to ib they are okay fine very interestingly guys you know um, um the right to information act the rti that we have in india of course rti has a very wide coverage 
but there are some agencies there are some institutions in india which are exempted from the right to information act and one such is ib so please remember this section 24 it's a very star mark very important section of the rti where certain organizations institutions are exempted where under this particular section uh, some uh, the rti does not implement on these like ib raw and all these kind of things like the institutions of national importance right we know about the ib ib is one of the oldest surviving intelligence organization in the world it's a very old agency and ib is an executive body that works and falls under ministry of home affairs at least remember that and you should also remember that the ib director directly reports to the prime minister and that is so because ib is one of the strategic policy group and joint intelligence committee of the national security council so if you read the statements 1 and 2 they are very correct options and the wrong we have eliminated right now look going forward guys question number 91 again this question is about with respect to the cbi i have told you to prepare cbi n number of time it is always very much in the news so do prepare about ib do prepare about the ed which is again very much in the news these days cbi all and even right now you have to prepare about supreme court you must prepare about the chief election uh, the chief election commission which is again very much in the news recently uh, what happened two days back uh, you know you you i'm sure you are following the news right so all these organizations which are in news these days do prepare about them the question was specifically with respect to the cbi you know one thing you always have to remember there are many confusions with respect to the cbi with many students do remember few things and everything can be solved number one cbi it is not under ministry of home affair like 90% students have this confusion that cbi works under home ministry no the cbi it functions under ministry of personal pension and public grievances first of all is this so ministry of home affair eliminate right now from your head cbi is not a constitutional body it is not even a statutory body cbi was formed as an executive body where it derive its power from the delhi special police establishment act 1946 though it is a nodal agency that cooperates uh, with the interpol uh, uh, you know countries from on indian behalf but it is neither statutory nor constitutional it is just an executive body and cbi of course cbi launched a very famous operation called chakra 2 to fight against the transnational organized cyber enable financial crimes where of course it it partnered with microsoft and amazon uh and that was to tackle the cyber enabled financial crimes <clears throat> uh, even the transnational crimes were there now look at the statement guys the first statement is wrong it says it is non constitutional but statutory no it is non statutory so yeah i have i option 1 is incorrect right answer is b because cbi launched operation chakra for cyber enabled financial crisis that is absolutely correct so here the answer is uh, uh, you uh, you have the answer as 2 b only now this question i would say it this question was an uh, was a medium one because first statement is something you can figure out but of course maybe you are not aware of the operation chakra so that knowledge is all only going to come from the current affairs so do read current affairs a lot especially these kind of agencies which are in the news guys so you can skip uh, you can attempt this risk it if you want but be a little bit careful next question number 92 is with respect to the national commission for backward classes now again this this in this question you are supposed to figure out which statement is not correct okay be careful about it so what we have to learn about the national commission for backward classes so please remember that national commission for backward classes was set up in 1993 but that time it was just just a statutory body initial 1993 it was uh, set up as a statutory body only it was way back in 9 in 2018 under 102nd constitutional amendment act national commission for backward classes got a constitutional status 
and now this commission is under article uh, 338b okay 338b um, is the one so now 338 is about sc 338a is about st and 338b is with respect to backward classes now it is a constitutional status remember but it was not from the beginning it it, it began as statutory body now please remember now whenever you are talking about the uh, backward classes there is another important other than 338b there is one more article that you have to remember that is 342a under this article it empowers the president who can specify the socially educationally backward classes in various states and ut the power is with the president please remember however he always do that uh, classification uh, uh, by doing the consultation with the governor of the concerned state but ultimately the power of putting any caste as a or marking any caste as a backward class that purely reside with the president of india however law of the parliament is then required to put that caste in the list of the backward classes and then finally it can get the all the benefits so it's a step so governor taken into the account president has the power but parliament has to enact the bill to put why it is required please understand it is important for you to learn this very interesting fact in india there are two obc lists that we have one is called the central obc list and another is called the state obc list means the state list does not always going to reflect the state list means there can be one caste who may not be obc in the state but may be obc as per the central list or again vice versa there may be a caste which is not a uh, obc as per the national level but may it may, it may be obc in that one particular state understand so there are two types of obc list and uh, based on that based on that but in case of st in the case of sc and st there is always going to be one list be it state or national level so there with respect to obc only we have this privilege of two list where uh, the center has its own obc list and uh, the state has its own obc list please remember whenever the national commission on backward classes whenever it hears any case or investigate any case or does any inquiry nbc now has the power of a civil court i mean when the nbc is going to in inquire or in investigate any issue any complaint it has the power to summon the people examining them on oath requiring production of any document of public record even re receiving the evidences so just as the civil court works the same way N ncbc is ha uh, uh, it has the power if you come back to the question guys please read the statements very carefully so first statement is correct yes nbc got constitutional status in 102 that is fine and even uh, but there is problem with the statement number 2 why it says it says under 342a uh, it empower the governor to specify no governor does not have it is the president who has the power to specify any caste as obc not uh, the governor governor is only consulted right so the second statement is wrong third and fourth are correct so yes nbc has civil court power yes and the fourth is also correct so obc list may be it's a part of state list but may not be a part of the central list because we have two obc list that we just discussed the question was asking you which statement is not correct not correct so only one is not correct this question was a tough one but because you have four statements the best part about four statement is you have enough options to eliminate and judge the statements it was a tough one but i think you can take a little bit of risk because you have enough options which are simple and can make you uh, you know attempt this question at least that takes us to the question number 93 question 93 was with respect to article 145 where it says as per article 143 1453 of indian constitution it says when a case involves substantial question of the law relate to the interpretation of the constitution it must be decided by bench of at least three judges dekho first statement is wrong article and everything is fine whenever 
whenever there is any question with respect to the interpretation of the constitution it's a very serious thing like supreme court has many duties many responsibilities and one of the primary duties of the supreme court is to interpret the constitution so that there is no scope of any ambiguity <coughs> now it's it's a very serious thing please understand for anything which is of you know prime importance there is a provision that there has to be a minimum five judge bench minimum five judges need to sit and you have a very recent uh, example where uh, the supreme court gave a verdict in the electoral bond cases in the electoral bond cases so the the serious the matter the more judges are going to be part of that because it says the more the better the more number of opinions is always going to give better judgment right so whenever the question is about interpretation of the constitution say huge task is a big task there has to be minimum five judges and again first statement is wrong you have just understood and second is also wrong because it says a right to vote is a fundamental right is it a fundamental right no right to vote is a constitutional right it is not a fundamental right so this was a pretty easy one in 2017 you also had a question the same kind of question where it was directly asked that right to vote is what so it is a funda it is not a fundamental right it is simply a constitutional right so in this case uh, which is correct neither is correct both are incorrect i think the question was a easy one and i think everyone must have attempted the question without any hitch without any problem okay in your um, um, in your pdfs the whole detail things are given now please remember this one particular very interesting case because uh, it was the anoop baranwal case remember the name of the case maybe you may have a question coming on that case directly because it's a very recent case in 2023 only the anoop baranwal versus union of india where the supreme court uh, gave it gave a verdict and clearly mentioned that right to vote is a constitutional right so do remember the name sometimes you have a question directly coming on the verdict like for example there was a question once that uh, uh, js putu swami judgment relates to what it relates to right of privacy right so that that you have taken to account question 94 or oh, this is a very interesting question question 94 is with respect to right to freedom of religion you know in our constitution article 25 to article 28 talks about the freedom of religion okay now if you look at the three statements let's let's understand let's presume that you have you are not very well prepared just understand and try to remember the concept of secularism in india keep secularism in india you know that in india religion is clearly not one of the priorities of the state you know that right india is a secular country look at the first statement any educational institution recognized by the government or receiving the financial support from the government cannot force any individual of that educational institution to participate in any religious instruction because in india religion can never be enforced so of course in the schools in the educational institutions you can't force anybody to take a part of to take a part in any uh, religious inst- uh, uh, you know ceremony that because if that happens this is a clear violation of re- freedom of religion so yes there is no such provision then it says article 27 for for some time let's forget about the article let's say i am not sure if this article is correct or not but what it says it ensures individuals are not forced to contribute through taxes towards promoting maintaining specific religion because in india we are secular country you can't force anybody to pay taxes like like there was a time you know when mughals or other uh, uh, sultanate leaders they used to put uh, religious taxes on hindus like for example jajia jajia was put on the hindus uh, you know so there is no such provision today of course we are a secular country so i'm not sure about if it is 27 or not but let's assume that this is also correct because remaining part of the question looks fine then number 3 it says that a right to freedom of conscience and free profession practice of religion is there 
in India, but it is restricted on the basis of public order, morality, health, of course. In the name of religion, you are not supposed to do any nonsense thing. In the name of religion, you can't disturb, go and disturb the public. You can't, you, in the name of religion, you can't wear something that is going to make people scare. You can't do any immoral act in the name of religion. Of course, every, every, not just this, every fundamental right in India is restricted to certain uh, preconditions. There are certain restrictions on that based on public order, morality and other things where yes, there are, and these are called reasonable restrictions. There is a clear wording in, in our constitution. Every fundamental right in India is subjected to reasonable restrictions okay so yeah all the three are absolutely correct my answer is one two three question was medium level but very easy to attempt because understanding the freedom of religion keeping secularism in mind you can give the answer as a correct one right question number 95 now this question is with respect to preventive detention now this is not a normal detention be careful the word is preventive detention First statement says, now what is a preventive detention? First think about it. Preventive detention is when, when we are going to arrest somebody just as a precautionary one because we fear that that person may cause trouble to the public order, to the public law and order. That person has not committed any crime yet but we are fearful that person can cause some nonsense so in order to maintain the law and order as a precautionary measure, I am going to detain that person. That is a provision that is there in Indian constitution, right? Okay. And all these uh, provisions are given under the article 22 that specifically talks about preventive detention. Now question is with respect to the preventive detention, right? Now please first look what the question talks about. Now first statement says, that preventive detention that we have just understood in a very normal language preventive detention means detention of a person by the state it's always by the state without trial and conviction purely and merely based on suspicion and here the district magistrate has a power where the DM can order to detain this particular person in order to maintain the public order like law and order and that is the case. Now very interestingly with respect to preventive detention there are certain provisions. Under our article 22 subpart 4 there is as such there is no law providing for preventive detention shall authorize any detention of a person longer than three periods. There is no such law in any any constitution but but in uh, the constitution does not have any provision but it, it all depends on the advisory board. Advisory board that consists of the persons who are qualified to be appointed as judges. Now uh, you know all these members are part of advisory board. Advisory board on its own can uh, make some of the laws and as per the advisory board recently any person that you are going to detain as a preventive detention you cannot keep that person for more than three months under preventive detention. After that, you of course need to uh, present that person uh, in front of the court and there has to be a trial. You can't, you can't keep a person for more than three months without trial and conviction. No, you can't do that. But, but this particular kind of rules are not there. In these conditions are not in our constitution. Constitution does not say anything, any condition about preventive detention. It only talks about preventive detention under Article 22. Understood? The power is given to the advisory board. Now, again, uh, the now if you look at the question here, <clears throat> the first statement says, with respect to preventive detention, first statement says, Indian constitution under certain condition allow person detained for all this. Is it, is it, uh, uh, the Indian constitution specifying the things of three months or something? No. No, it is, it is not the Indian constitution. So first statement is not correct. Now look, the question itself is about preventive detention. Look at the second statement. It says, 
that article 22 says all the safeguards apply to any person under preventive detention why if i have to give that person all the safeguards there is no point detaining uh, detaining that person without uh, trial and conviction if anybody is convicted in india after its conviction yes that person is going to have all the safeguards but for the preventive detention there is no concept of safeguards because if you apply that there is no point keeping a person under preventive detention so here in this case yes the uh, right answer is d because both statements are wrong question again was a tough one but you can take a risk because at least second statement is easy and uh, but yeah if you are absolutely not aware and you are not even sure for any part of the questions you can skip it altogether because again this was a tough question very little scope of applying your common sense question 96 is a very simple question it is with respect to the adoption right whenever you think of adoption in india please think about central adoption resource authority called the cara it is the most and the probably the only authority in india that take care of the adoption rights very very important now if, if you look at the look at the statement first you should know certain things about the adoption in india please remember cara which is a statutory body functioning under the ministry of child uh, women and child development it is the agency responsible for mandating monitoring all the adoptions in india so cara is like a one stop solution okay this cara has to maintain a pool of children who are legally up available for the adoption please remember that we also have a Ju juvenile justice amendment act 2021 that was passed that act was made to prevent the court delays in adoption and that is why under the juvenile justice act district magistrate was given the power and even the additional district magistrates they were also given the power so that the adoption process can be can be speed up and there is no delay for uh, any reason in this under this juvenile uh, justice act very interesting things were said with respect to adoption in india now right now under the act even a single person or a couple uh, like you know a married couple both can go and go for the adoption of the child yes the law does not prohibit anybody on sexual orientation that means even the people of lgbtq community even they can apply to cara for being single parent but please aware since you can't have a same sex marriages in india they are still not legalized in india homosexual sexuality is de decriminalized uh, there is no article 377 uh, right now section 377 right now so after 2018 homosexuality is decriminalized but again same sex marriages are not allowed so you can't have you can't you can't go and say that we are same sex couples and we want to apply but yes for lgbtq as a single parent adoption is is allowed under the particular act so in this case all the three statements that you have are correct uh, this question <clears throat> i think um, Sec, uh, you know ex except the number two first and third are very obvious statements uh, there was only problem with the second statement that makes this question a little tough uh, but again you can attempt it you can at least take a risk because at least first and third statement are correct guys okay now moving to the question number 97 now question 97 <clears throat> is with respect to the rti act uh, it talks about how the RTI Act the, has to reply and it also talks about the Central Information Commissioner. So first we have to learn about these two things. Both statements are correct in the case. Please remember whenever you think of the RTI, first of all be very clear that the whole concept of the Right to Information RTI Act, it has its root under the Article 19 which is one of the most important article of our democratic constitution article 19 gives the freedom of speech and expression so the rti is rooted under this particular article right rti was formulated based on the recommendations given by the shoddy committee and of course because of the rti movement that was there in india uh, led by mazdoor kisan shakti sangathan interestingly 
if there is any rti uh, you know uh, at rti uh, demand rti uh, letter under this rti act if the question relates to the life and liberty of any person if the rti is basically with respect to life or liberty of a person then the public information officer is bound to give the reply within 48 hours this is really really very very fast and for, and similarly there are many provisions very specific guidelines and deadlines given to the rti like for example if the request needs to be made to the public officer yes within 30 days you have to do that if again uh, if the uh, if the rti is with respect to corruption or any human right violation within 48 45 days the reply needs to be given so yeah there are time limits for the rti queries but in that matter when life and liberty is concerned it is with respect within 48 hours very important if you look at another interesting concept here it is the president of india that is that appoints the central information commissioner in india cic is the you know head of this whole rti act but president select or appoint the cic based on the recommendations of a committee okay there's a committee of three persons we have prime minister leader of opposition and a union cabinet minister these three has this committee and whatever name they uh, choose by by you say majority then that name goes to president and president appoint that person as a cic similarly in case of state the governor also appoints the state information commissioner again based on the three person committee the chief minister leader of opposition in vidhan sabha and the state cabinet minister okay so this is the, the process it is the same one so if you look at the question guys here both statements are absolutely correct of course be careful about these kind of things so many different different kind of rtis has different different limits so do read them uh, also in this case both statements are correct answer is c this question was a medium one but i think this was an easy to attempt because the statements and questions are quite clear that takes us to the question number 98 question 98 again is very tricky question because it says which statement is not correct not correct very careful okay now interestingly this whole question is uh, is a very lengthy long question why i'm saying it's a long question because it talks about the appointment of judges and you know appointment of judges to the high court supreme court it's a whole together very complex topic let me make it little bit easy for you guys now it talks about the collegium appointment how judges are appointed in india it, it is a and this question is about choosing the not right one okay please be careful because appointment of the judges is one of the hot topic that is that is there in the news right now the government does not want to continue with the collegium the supreme court is happy and wants to continue with collegium what is that let's try to understand right now in india if there is there is a appointment of a high court judge how the high court judge in india is appointed it is done by the chief justice of the high court in consultation with the high court collegium what is that high court collegium high court collegium means three member group in in those three member this high uh, high court collegium consists of three member one the same the uh, the chief justice of the high court plus two senior most judges okay now this is how the high court judges are appointed in case of supreme court in case of the supreme court supreme court are uh, judges are appointed by collegium of five members where we have the chief justice of india plus four most senior judges that is how the supreme court judges are appointed in india now the chief justice in consultation with the two senior most judges of supreme court uh, has has the right has uh, it forms an opinion of who uh, is to be recommended for the appointment to the high court that is that is how the supreme court also contributes to the appointment of the judges right this is important so everything is done as this this is called the collegium system collegium actually means judges appointing judges and that is where the government the present government does not want to want to continue with the system 
because there are many obligations on collegium system that this system is not transparent, how judges are appointing other judges, this is not constitutional and so and so. But you should be a little bit aware about the history of the collegium system in India. Now the whole, the whole collegium system, it evolved, it was not there in any constitution. There is no constitutional basis of the collegium. It, this system of collegium evolved over a period of time by different, different judges, uh, judgments of the Supreme Court. Collectively, they are known as the three judges cases. So we have the three very interesting judgments. It was the first judge case, second judge case and the third judge case. Based on these three judgments, the present day collegium is formulated uh, uh, by, the, by the Supreme Court, right? In the very first uh, case, judge's case, the Supreme Court decided the recommendation of the CGI did not bind the pres president in appointing the judges. But then later on, this was actually against the collegium kind of thing. But then in 1993, Supreme Court reversed its own decision and from there, the beginning of collegium started where the Supreme Court said, whatever advice, whatever name we give, that president would be bound by the advice of Chief Justice of India. And that is how the collegium started with the CGI and only two senior most judges. But later on 1998, Supreme Court clarified that Supreme Court collegium must have the CGI and the number was increased to the four senior most judges and this is exactly what we have at present. Now, now the uh, Supreme Court Collegium has five members, CGI and four senior most judges. I hope that is clear. Okay. Now also be, be clear, whenever, if by chance there is a vacancy, if the vacancy is expected in the office of judges uh, uh, Supreme Court, it is, it is the CGI that initiate the proposal and uh, uh, you know forward that proposal to the union minister of the law and then, then, then the whole process starts. Please remember, so in, if you look at the question, look at the statement guys, you have, you have the problem with the first statement. Why first statement is problematic? Look what it says. Now we just have understood the, how judges of Supreme Court, High Court are appointed. Now it says the proposal for appointment of a judge of a High Court initiated by the law minister. Is it the law minister? No, absolutely no. It is to be initiated by the chief justice or uh, it, it is to be a point, it is to be uh, uh, starting by the, to be initiated by the justice of the high court, not the law minister. So one is absolutely wrong. Remaining three are correct here. You are supposed to figure out which statement is not correct. The answer is A. This was again a tough question. I agree. And please skip if you are not aware because there is no scope of any kind of tukkabazi, no scope of any kind of taking any risk. It's, it, it was a tough question guys. Now question number 99, very interesting question and in this you are supposed to figure out which statement is correct. Now this question talks about the prisons. You, we all know that prison is a state subject, right? So prison is a state subject under the list 2 of the 7 schedule. Very interesting schedule which talks about the union list, the state list, the concurrent list and the residuary powers. So prison we know it is a state uh, subject where the rules and governing process of premature releases are framed by the states. Yes, first statement is correct. Second statement says the state where the trial ended due to exceptional circumstances should consider the application for premature release, not the state where the crime occurred. Like, please understand. Suppose, now since prison is a state subject, okay, now let's say somebody has committed a crime in Gujarat and after the trial and tribulation that person uh, is, right now the trial uh, started in the state of Karnataka, let's say, okay, and that person right now is uh, in the jail of Karnataka. Please understand, if if there is any application for a premature release of that kind of person who committed a crime in other state but right now in trial under other state, for, for application of premature release, only the state where the crime occurred, that is going to consider the application, not the state where the trial is being done. Because ultimately what is more important, where the crime had happened. 
So this statement clearly, clearly you can eliminate because you understand the, the state where crime has happened is more important than the state of the trial, right? First statement is correct, second is incorrect. Even the third statement is not correct. Why? It says respite. Respite is respite about the execution of the sentences? No. You know that these there are five things uh, that, that can be done if there is any case of any uh, sentence. Any sentence of the punishment can be, can be dealt by five ways. I hope you know about that and you have read about it a number of times. So whenever whenever there is any application for the relief uh, of that person, the president and the governor both have five uh, uh, pardon powers. One is called pardon. Pardon is when you are going to get free from the sentence and the conviction. You walk free like a free man. If president or governor gives you uh, uh, the pardon, you are absolutely free man. You are absolutely going to be completely all the sentences, punishment, disqualification is going to, going to be absolved. But then there are other forms also. Like, like for example, there is a provision of commutation. Commutation, when, whenever the sentence is commuted by president or governor, commutation simply means you are substituting one form of the punishment with the other one. For example, somebody has got a, a death penalty and you are commuting the death penalty into lifetime imprisonment, right? Then we have something called as remission. What is a remission? Remission is when you are reducing the period. You are not changing the nature of the sentence. You are simply reducing the period. If somebody has got seven year of regress punishment, you are making it a five year. So simply reducing the time period of the punishment is called remission. Then you have two very close words. One is respite, one is reprieve. Please remember, it is reprieve. Reprieve is staying the execution of the sentence, especially if that is a case of a death penalty, then the person can take a stay for a certain number of time. That is called reprieve. Respite actually means under some very extraordinary circumstances. If a person is going to get a lesser sentence uh, in place of the original uh, award due to some circumstances. For example, uh, if there is a if there is a there is a, a prisoner who got a rigorous imprisonment, let's say, but he got some kind of physical disability, then of course the the he is going to get lesser punishment than the original one. Another such special case can be if the woman got pregnant, uh, if the offender is pregnant, then of course he he is that she is not going to get that uh, heavy punishment. So that is called respite. Respite. So here the option is incorrect because you know it says respite. It is not respite, it is reprieve. Reprieve is about staying the execution. You remember that? Now please understand, president and the governor both have the power of pardon. But the president can give pardon even in the case of a death penalty and also in case of a court martial. Whereas governor can never ever give pardon in these two matters, court martial and the death penalty. That way, the pardoning power of president is way wider and bigger and larger than the governor. So second, third incorrect, first is correct. My answer here is only one. So yes, this question was definitely a medium one, but uh, I think you can attempt it because uh, one and three are absolutely easy statements. Second, you have to apply your knowledge, your common sense. That takes us to the last question, which is, which again, the question is about not correct. Now, please look at the statement. It is talking about the representation of the People Act 1951. Now, what you have to keep in the mind while attempting this question? Now, please remember that in India, when it comes to disqualification of the member of parliament, it is article 102 that deals with the disqualification. Be It can be from Lok Sabha or the Rajya Sabha. Now, on what basis uh, MP can be disqualified in India? There are certain conditions under the Article 102 and it specifies that uh, the, the conditions can be if the MP is holding office of profit, if the uh, MP is of unsound mind, discharge insolvent, discharge insolvent means he or she is not able to pay their debt that is called discharge insolvent. Even when if by chance that person 
uh, voluntary gives the give away the citizenship of India and is no he or she is no more the citizen of India, then of course he can't be member of parliament, right? Or maybe he is disqualified by any other act of the parliament. All these conditions are mentioned in one zero two. Look at the first statement. What it says now? Now our first statement says. It is the representation of the People Act 1951 where the rules are there for disqualifying a person. No, these rules are there in Article 102, not the representation of People Act. So first statement is wrong. First statement is wrong and which is not correct. Only my first statement is not. Second statement is correct. Yes, we, we, we have just seen in case of the best case we have seen is the is that case of Rahul Gandhi where he was convicted for the offense. So a representation of people act says if anybody, anybody, he or she gets a conviction of two years or more, then of course he or she by default going to be disqualified as a member of parliament and af even after the end of the sentence for next six years that person is not going to get, uh, fight for the election. And uh, that was something that happened with Rahul Gandhi. Of course, later on, Supreme Court overturned all the judgments of the High Court. So right now, which statement is not correct? The first is not correct, <clears throat> right? Again, this question was uh, the was a medium one. Uh, of course, the first you have to be careful about. So I always say, guys, uh, uh, for this upcoming prelims, please read this particular act. This is going to be a very, very crucial act for your upcoming prelims. Because given this is an election year, uh, do expect a lot of questions coming with respect to elections and all the related acts. So my suggestion, do read about this act in detail, very, very easy and very, very important as well. Okay, so that is all from my side. That's the end of the test number four. I hope you have enjoyed and learned a lot of things. If you did, then do let me know your feedback in the comment section below. And my best wishes for your upcoming prelims, you guys, with the test number five. Best of luck. Keep studying hard for the prelims. And yes, don't forget to check out our test series. Link is given in description below. Take care. Jai Hind. Jai Bharat.